listening to Ideas on Trapped with Toby Lawson. Welcome to Ideas on Trap podcast and I am her host Toby Lawson. My guest on this episode is Christopher Olaolua Ogumodedi, who is returning to the show for the third time. Chris and I start by exploring his thoughts on many of the eponymous events in Nigeria over the past one year, starting from the NSAS protest against police brutality by young people, the widespread insecurity sweeping all parts of the country, the incessant talk of restructuring Nigeria, and also a reconsideration of the failed state hypothesis in the Nigerian context. Chris is an expert on comparative politics who specializes in authoritarianism, regional integration, diasporism, and social movements in Africa. He is an associate editor with World Politics Review and his work has appeared in prestigious publications like The Guardian and The Republic. It is always interesting talking to Chris and this time was no exception. I hope you enjoy it and thank you all for listening. Ideas on Trap is sponsored by iInvest. iInvest is Nigeria's foremost digital platform for trading financial products like treasury bills, fixed deposit notes, commercial papers, euro bonds, and many more. It is the leading financial services marketplace and gives you access to investment opportunities from various financial services providers within a single secure platform. Download the iInvest app on your Google Play Store or iOS App Store today and start investing at your convenience from anywhere in the world. Terms and conditions apply. And now, let's listen to the podcast. Welcome to the show, Chris. It's great to have you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, a lot has really happened since the last time we spoke. I would like to start with NSARS. I okay. recall that when the protest started, before even before the full protest, when the mild disturbance in Ugeli started, I recall you and I had a brief exchange on Twitter, and you were sort of telling me how that entire situation was kind of pregnant with some volatility, especially in the urban centers. And of course, that happened, and it ended the way it ended. The Nigerian state acted tragically or predictably, and we are still reeling from some of the after effects. So what I want to ask you briefly, you wrote a piece interrogating the events surrounding that particular episode. Um, Mm -hmm. What can we take going forward? From what I know, I know that's a bit of a big question, but basically, what can we learn, so to speak, from that particular episode? So, has a new movement been birthed? Because we saw a lot of young people, it used to be old heads who are really active in the activism of politics doing protests in Nigeria, but this was mainly driven by young people who were organizing themselves through social media. That in itself is not new, I and mean, social media as a tool for organizing has been around since maybe the Arab Spring, probably before that. And mm-hmm. you were also a volunteer for the Obama campaign. We know the role that social media played in that movement. So can we say that in the civic space, we are witnessing something new, or that was just an interruption? Well, my view is that um, these sorts of spontaneous organic movements tend to require some time before you can make a 180 assessment. So I guess my answer would be to be determined. I will say that in the annals of Nigerian political organizing, it's not that social media driven organizing is new to Nigeria. As you said, I remember Occupy Nigeria being arguably the first What is new, I think, is the fact that this was political organization, political organizing moments that was driven by young Nigerians, you know, and what colloquially would be referred to as Gen Z. You know, the heart and soul of this entire movement was in very specific terms, actually, young Nigerian women under 30. You know, whether you look at 
the first set of um, fundraisers, the pro bono lawyers, the organizers across the country, really, Lagos, Ibadan, Oshobo, Ogumosho, Port Harcourt, Calabar, Jos, Kaduna, where, Abuja, wherever you want to look. When you look very closely at the marchers, demonstrators, cooks, you know, the entire infrastructure of the protest was driven by young Nigerian women on that 30. That's very significant, especially when you consider that the common refrain about this specific demographic is that, oh, you know, they are too apathetic, you know, they are always quote, pressing their phone and all of this stuff. They won't get their PVC. They don't know anything, uh, coconut heads. That's been the common refrain, right? And I sort of referred to it in two pieces that I wrote about ENSA, saying that to view it this way is to misunderstand the sources of their discontent. And that is that the electoral system does not reflect their preferences and it doesn't drive them to want to partake in it. That when given the space to draw up forms of interactions and political organisms that they want, they will do so in very, very robust ways. And that's ENSAS. That is quite literally what they did in ENSAS. So I guess the jury, as I said, still remains out as to how we can define ends as is it a social movement, is it a protest, you know, because the two things are sort of distinct. Protest can be one form of social movement, but they are not the same thing. So we don't know at this point. You know, it's been, I guess, seven, eight months since the end of the mass demonstrations. But as I say, it is definitely a new articulation of political participation in post-independence Nigeria. Yeah. A few things. I mean, I hear you. It's too early to really know the effects this might have. But you see a lot of talking points, either on social media or even in the traditional media, trying to do some kind of post-mortem in a way. And one thing that came up was that that protest or the agitation would have had more impact if there were leaders, people that the government can negotiate with. Even going as far as to say that people that can properly disperse the demonstrators before the army moved in on Leki and all that. Would you say that's an accurate observation or you know, what's wrong with that? It's certainly one view, uh, and as I say, in Nigeria, I mentioned this very specifically in the first piece I wrote for um, World Politics Review. I said that in Nigeria, historically, protests and political organizing has been driven by large centralized entities, you know, such as unions, social organizations, student groups, farmers groups, labor unions, and other collective entities like that with a clearly identifiable and recognizable leadership that can easily go into negotiations with authority figures. The difficulty with that is that the visibility and identifiability of those leaders, as it were, is a double-edged sword in the sense that you then have a situation where these quote-unquote leaders get into negotiations with the government and very often have conversations that run counter to what the collective actually wants. And then what happens is you start to see splinters all over the place. And this is, of course, not unique to Nigeria. This is common in all kinds of protest movements and you know, social movements across the world, where you generally speaking, but not always, have splits between more accommodationist elements versus more people who want to break away from the status quo. And very often, those fissures become very apparent when you have quote-unquote leaders. As far as I understood it, as someone who, you know, spoke with and to participants in NSAS, their major issue with the leadership question was that this is not that kind of movement. We've learned from the difficulties of previous movements, you know, as I've alluded to. We don't want anyone speaking for anyone else, or at least at this stage. You know, I don't want this impression that the ENSAS demonstrators had their head in the sand about this because they didn't, if at least all of the arguments were being weighed in good faith. Their argument was that how do you get into a conversation or a discussion or a negotiation, whatever you want to call it, with the government when 
our very basic requests are not even being met, right? You know, you remember the five points that they mentioned. You remember initially how dismissive, you know, authority figures were about them, whether it's the police or whether it's the political class, you know. Early on, this movement wasn't taken seriously. I don't want people to forget that. This movement wasn't even paid attention to in the media. It wasn't until it sort of overwhelmed Twitter. Let's not forget, that's where all of this started. When NSARS was trending well beyond the shores of Nigeria, in Nairobi, in London, Johannesburg, Berlin, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, I, I saw Dubai. That's when the feedback came to Nigeria. And only then did the political class and the, I guess, collective elites start to take this seriously. So I would like for us to step back a little bit and try to do a little bit of retracing our steps to remember that these people wanted to go into conversations only when they were being treated in good faith. And by and large, that didn't happen. So if we recognize that, I'm not sure what appointing quote-unquote leaders would have changed. And hence why so many officials in the federal government and the state governments were hanging on to police reform, even though NSARS could not have been more clear about what they wanted in SARS. So this shift to, quote, police reform seemed very much like a sidestepping of what the fundamental issue was, that here's this police unit that's incredibly abusive, incredibly violent, incredibly criminal in its behavior. We want to disband it, and we want investigations into their conduct, and any persons who have been found to have engaged in such behavior be held to account. But there was no discussion of any of this. Then you remember the then inspector general of police, quote unquote, disbanded SARS and created SWAT without any articulation of what would come next. Then, of course, the, um, the federal government talked about creating these panels of inquiries in the states and this and that. But by and large, you had a situation where both federal and state officials were not treating the movement with the kind of seriousness and good faith that it deserved. So if you know that, what leaders do you need to appoint and what are you going to talk about? So in my view, I'm not sure what leadership, quote unquote, would have changed other than some people go and strike agreements or have conversations or centralize authority within their domain in ways that run counter to the spirit of the movement. Yeah. So here we are, right? Six, seven months after that episode. By and large, nothing has really changed. Young people are still pretty much angry, disappointed, frustrated by the system. The main tool where all this started, like you said, Twitter, is currently banned by federal <laughs> government yeah. in Nigeria. Yeah. And in what is fast becoming an abuse of logic, NSAS features in one of the reasons that the government gives in taking that action. So attention mm. has sort of shifted to INEC. Oh, get your PVC. Mm -hmm. Let's vote mm -hmm. these people out. And I know you've been somewhat of a critic of a wholesale adoption of that view. So what is wrong with yes. yeah. that line of thought that, oh, let's just get our PVCs, let's just get out and vote these people out and everything will be all right. Yeah, we've talked about this previous conversation and something I've spoken so much about on Twitter. And the second piece I mentioned earlier was very specifically dedicated to this viewpoint. And I wrote about it extensively, So, uh, but I'm more than happy to essentially abridge what my critique of that viewpoint. And it's very simple. The decisions that are made by elected officials cannot be constrained to the ballot box only. And your political engagement goes beyond election. The problem with, oh, let's vote out the bad people, let's vote in the good people, is that that's simply not how institutional politics works. It's not about good versus bad. A better question to ask is, what is the theory of change in our newfound enthusiasm towards electoral politics? In other words, why do we want to get rid of these people? What is it that we haven't seen? And how do we ensure we see it? Now, when you ask that question, you will start to realize, for example, that there are very few social institutions in Nigeria that are regarded as credible across the board. Right. And when you understand how politics, large P politics works, is that 
party politics are merely one expression of political engagement. You know, and I mentioned in that piece about Alexis de Tocqueville's talk about intermediary institutions, that institutions that sort of act as a back channel between party politics and the public. You know, I guess that classic divide of uh, state and citizen. These intermediary institutions will serve as a bulwark against, you know, extremism, overreach, and uh, aggrandizing behavior on the part of the state from which party elites, at least in societies where political parties are the main vehicle for um, electoral competition, which is virtually most societies. So when you then start to say, oh, we just need to get out the good and bad people, well, you haven't interrogated where their so-called goodness is going to come from. What institutions will underpin the kind of political engagement that you desire with the new class of political elites you want in power. You know, you agree that the previous class have woefully underperformed because they are unrepresentative of your desires and aspirations. They are not transparent. They are certainly not accountable. Well, how will you do that? And do you think that kind of trajectory will begin on election day? And very likely the answer is no. You have to do a deep dive into what those people believe. You know, you have to understand what is their vision of government. What do they understand government to be? What do they understand their role as citizens, first of all? Because you have to remember that in representative democracy, these people work for you and not the other way around. So if you are going to put them into these positions, how are they going to represent you? To what extent will your view be taken into consideration? What will be the nature of engagement between citizen and state? And when you understand how politics work, you will realize very quickly that these questions do not exist in isolation. People surround the political class, whether they're political aides, whether they're lobbyists, whether they're fellow legislators or executives or judges. That's when you realize very quickly this is a problem across the board, you know, and the lack of accountability and transparency and all of these things. They do not start on election day. They will not end on election day. And it's a mistake to think that a ballot cast once in four years, quadrennially, will solve all of your problems for the entirety of that electoral window. It's a mistake. That's simply not how politics works anyway, and certainly not in Nigeria. The question is, when they are in office, what alternative, those intermediary institutions I refer to, what alternative mechanisms are you going to use to put pressure on your legislators, your um, governors, your judges? Because don't forget, the judiciary is one arm of government. They are accountable to you. Just because they aren't elected doesn't mean they are not accountable to you. And again, this refers to what I think is a problem of civics in Nigeria and many other societies, but, you know, for the purpose of this conversation, we are referring to Nigeria. People think elections equals politics and politics equals elections. No, absolutely not. Elections are one expression of political competition. Politics, in its very basic sense, refers to the contest of ideas, interests, preferences, and most importantly, the ability to determine who gets what, where, and when, and how. You know, who gets the limited, finite resources, who gets to make the decisions about how to allocate them, and things of that nature. So when you understand a bit more holistically about what politics is, what it's supposed to do, and how it works, you will realize very quickly that election day is not the time to start to ask these very fundamental questions about representative democracy. So I hope that sort of summarizes my critique of the let's get our PVC movement. I mean, that's very enlightening. Let me just detour here a bit, you know. I want to talk about restructuring, but before getting to that question, hearing you speak, something just, I mean, popped right into my head, and maybe you have an answer, I don't know. Like, what the fuck is actually wrong with our politicians? Like, <laughs> how did we get to a place where the two major parties just have a bunch of I don't know. I don't want to swear on the podcast because we all see what's going on in the country, especially coming off the NSAS incident. We could not see any politician, particularly in the opposition, step up <laughs> and offer an alternative vision. You know, so yeah. extending your answer a bit, 
is that problem due mm. to the malfunctioning of those intermediary institutions like you said and is that where we should really focus our energy in agitating in advocating in debating mm. well yes in a short form yes um this reconfiguration of the political system it's got to be consistent and it's two pronged so when i make this case i always want to clarify i am not by any means disregarding the um, value or efficacy of electoral politics. That's not what this is about. Mm -hmm. I recognize that electoral politics are the most large-scale expression of civic participation, as I mentioned. They are certainly the most visible. And, you know, for good reason, people recognize them as having collective benefits. And I agree with all of that. I also want to be clear that electoral politics in and of itself will not bring the kinds of positive outcomes that citizens want. So in as much as it's important to focus on, you know, the party system, state institutions that manage elections like INEC, the judiciary and all of that, it's also important to look at informal institutions around elections, you know, like unions, for example. Unions have an incorrect, I mean, I don't need to explain to you how crucial unions are in mobilizing in uh, get out the vote operations, in seeking endorsement. I mean, you live in Lagos. You know better than most people how crucial unions are, market women groups, civil service unions, NURTW, teachers unions. These entities are technically not party organizations, nor are they state institutions, but their influence is unmissable. So have you understood the constellation of forces? that influence party politics beyond election day? By and large, the answer is no for the average. You know, look, I'm a political scientist. I work in, you know, diplomacy and foreign policy. I know that the average person is not like me, and I don't want to miss that point, right? But if you want your politics to improve, to get better, well, you've got to understand it better yourself as a citizen. And very often, and I say by our, I guess I'm referring very specifically to the middle class, really and truly, because after all, the middle class are the most visible discourses about politics, does not understand these issues in the way they probably should. I mean, look at, for example, turnout at local government elections in Lagos. It's abysmal. Lagos generally has really atrocious turnout levels, but all the more so at the local level, where arguably that is where all the energy should go towards because that's the care of government close, the closest to you. So, you know, there is so much that needs to go into cleaning out the rot, as it were. It's a little mistaken to think all of that effort should start at the top, you know, at PDP or APC national chapter. You know, what have you actually done to improve political accountability on the local level? What have you done on the state level, before you say you go to the federal level. And, you know, a lot of these questions, when you start to ask them, it will lead you to, well, how does that happen? And then when you ask that question, that will lead you to questions of constitutionalism and um, political arrangements, enumerated powers in the Constitution and all of these things. So you have to ask the right questions to get the right answer, is what I'm saying. And too often, those questions are not being asked. So at least they are asked in superficial ways that produce superficial answers. And that's where I think all of this go and get your PVC stems from. People ask questions are wrong in themselves, but they don't lend themselves to the kind of holistic theorizing, I may say, you know, because... It's not always important to get the precise answer, but when you ask good questions, you will be led to some interesting theories, some interesting thoughts, some in interesting counter ideas, you know, some interesting ways of thinking about the same problem in different ways or thinking about different problems in the same way. And I don't see much evidence of that. So that's why I say that in as much as it's important to reform the parties, reform INEC, reform the laws that govern uh, electoral politics, you also have to ask deeper questions about the society from which all these laws come from. And I guess this is one of the reasons why I don't like the whole, you know, I often hear, oh, institutions. We as Africans, especially in the middle class, have imbibed this idea that institutions are the cure to everything. Well, my answer, especially given the events of the last U.S. administration, is that, well, institutions haven't done that well. 
And that's pretty much part of the course across the Western world, where institutions have shown time and again that they have been insufficiently suited to answering some very difficult fundamental questions about democracy and government. So institutions by themselves will not solve your problem because you have to understand institutions as a set of organisms. You know, they operate together. They don't operate in isolation. Institutions are product of people and their beliefs and their interests, and their preferences, and the ideas they hold. So if the prevailing sentiment among a group of people with enough power to determine key outcomes is that the party system should not function, have all the institutions you want. They won't function in getting you to that outcome that you want. So you have to ask better questions. You have to think about political engagement much better, and you certainly have to think beyond formal institutions. I mean, looking at this, it's interesting how much of the political discourse in the country is all about talking about the same issues over and over again. Restructuring mm -hmm. is back in the news. Big time. Mm -hmm. And the president himself, I didn't hear it from his mouth, but there was a statement credited to him that mm -hmm. he's not going to restructure, does not know what that means. <laughs> I mean, those are safe assumptions. <laughs> Interestingly, the APC campaigned on the basis, one of the core propositions of the party is restructuring, and there was an LFI chaired committee that came up with a proposal for restructuring, and it's certainly interesting that they not been able to move an inch on that. So, looking at this whole restructuring thing, there's a lot and it's a morass of confusion. Some people say we should abolish the 1999 constitution and go back to the 1963 constitution. Some people want to write a new constitution. Some people mm -hmm. think, oh yeah, we should just pass amendments and mm -hmm. it should be fine. And of course, on the back of that, there are people who are seriously agitating for a complete and total secession from mm. the union called Nigeria, calling it illegitimate and based on a false or at least faulty basis. So mm -hmm. how can one make sense of these old restructuring debates? Yeah, I, those are all very cogent and vexing questions that there are no straightforward answers. Um, I do think that restructuring, and again, this is something you and I have talked about on Twitter a lot. Restructuring is like this, it's kind of like a temple, you know, it shows up at the least opportune time, <laughs> especially for the ruling government and the ruling party, you know. As you said, uh, APC campaign vigorously on restructuring, right? And they get into power and, you know, by and large, the core of the party essentially deads the issue, right? Meanwhile, PDP gives lip service to the idea. And look, I know my PDP listeners, and you know, they'll hear this and they're going to you know, roll their eyes. They come at me on Twitter. And, you know, the ones I know in real life, you know, they go at me, oh, this and that. But look, the facts are the facts. You know, we can all observe them for ourselves. PDP gives lip service to the idea of restructuring and uses it as a convenient sort of political football to kick around because, you know, they find that at least uh, rhetorically and conceptually, it's advantageous for them to do so. But the question to ask then is, well, when PDP was in power for 16 years, what did they do about restructuring? And look, I don't say this as a sort of what about this anymore as an attempt to dwell in the past, but the context of what I'm saying is that time and again, when political elites who bandy the restructuring issue have been in the position to do something substantive about it, they've done nothing. Now, of course, it's fair to note that, you know, President Goodluck Jonathan had become fab in 2014, and that wasn't followed up by his successor administration. Fine, I get all of that. But the larger point I'm trying to make is that these debates and issues of restructuring are not new. You know, they dated as far back as the drafting committee of the 79 constitution that was first um, put together in 75. You know, so these issues of whether it's fiscal federalism, resource control, or any of the, you know, sub concepts associated with restructuring, people were making them back then. And these issues existed, what, 45 odd years ago. So 
as you correctly noted, nothing is new as far as these debates. It's just they are driven by modern iterations of long existing issues. And the question to ask then, I think, is what is the nature of the relationship? I alluded to this in the previous topic. What do you want the relationship between the Nigerian state and citizen to look like? You know, and when you ask that question, for example, then you'll be able to get into questions of, you know, what form or system of government do you want? The federal system as it exists, does it work for Nigeria? If not, why not? If it is, if you think it's working, how could you make it better? You know, the question to ask yourself is that what is wrong with the status quo and how do you change it in ways that will either prevent these issues from reoccurring or should they reoccur? You put yourself in an enabling situation to deal with them when they come up. And you know, that is where I think debates about constitutionalism come in. You know, do you want to go back to the 79 constitution? What was it about that constitution that you think was so good about the relationship between the citizen and state? If you think that wasn't good enough, what is it about the 63 constitution that you think was so good? Or if you even want to write an entirely new constitution, how are you going to define that relationship in that constitution? Now, for my money, and this is just a personal view that people can disagree with, I'm certainly happy to engage disagreements and to think about where I might be thinking of this wrongly, but both the 99 and 79 constitutions were incredibly flawed in so many ways. I think that the nature of federalism as laid out in both constitutions do not lend themselves to empowering subnational units to do the things they should be doing as the tier of government closer to the people, right? I especially think that, and look, we get into this discussion of, oh, was it a military constitution or not, uh, which I think is mostly a red herring, because whatever side you take of that debate, whether it was or it wasn't, it doesn't escape the fact that the larger milieu of um, political theorizing, civic culture, came out of the military era. Right. Considering the fact that both of those constitutions were supervised by the armed forces, you can get into, you know, a semantic debate about, oh, it wasn't written by this, that, the third. But you cannot escape the fact that it was overseen by the armed forces of Nigeria, who took power illegally. A coup d'etat, by definition, is an unconstitutional takeover of the government, right? So if you accept that, list, and frankly speaking, I don't know that there's anything to disagree with about the premise that a coup d'etat by definition is an unconstitutional takeover of government, then the question to ask is, why do you think that a constitution overseen by said body that unconstitutionally took over government will write a constitution that isn't favorable to it, right? So when you ask some much more existential questions about the entities who supervise government and governance, then you ask way more interesting questions about how the relationship between constituent and authority in Nigeria should look like. And I don't say this to diminish the relevance of this restructuring debate. I just feel it's overflowed, at least the less interesting parts of the debate are generally overflowed, while the much more interesting ones don't get nearly the prominence it should, such as the fact that in quite a number of ways, there is evidence of restructuring to a certain extent. You know, a lot of states, for example, continue to do things for their citizens that the federal government isn't well equipped to do. And, you know, when you look at the fact that, for example, the Southwest governors came up with Amotekun, you know, imperfect as that is, and, you know, the Southeast governors have followed up with Ibu um, Bagu, or when you look at power generation efforts, right, in states like Edo, you know, um, when you look at like the Southeast, where the Southeast governors are doing some really interesting things on um, power generation and security, as I mentioned, as well as economic cooperation among and between the states. If you want to draw on that example, the lagos Kebi cooperation that was centered around rice production. Now, of course, there are things to critique about these interactions, right, on the subject, but have that discussion about restructuring beyond the familiar argument of fiscal federalism. And, and like I said, I don't say this to diminish substance of those arguments. But as I said, when you get to some point in the future when old problems reemerge or 
new problems we emerge. How do you tackle those issues without having to start from scratch again? So what will a new constitution say and do about restructuring old arguments of the past and today will not reemerge? And I'm not hearing much of that, in my opinion. Perhaps it's been discussed in spaces I'm not paying as, uh, as much attention to, and I'm happy to do so. But by and large, the focus of the conversation really is about retaining political power among the elite class. For example, they feel that the federal government has too much power. They would love to have a little bit more of that power closer to themselves. And the question is, to do what? I don't need to go into a long riff about just how tyrannical Nigerian governors can be, for example. You know, the question is, if you um, restructure or devolve more powers to them, what checks and balances are you going to put in there? What checks and balances should be there today that don't exist? And how will you ensure that, one, a new constitution has those checks and balances, or that when a new constitution does not sufficiently tackle those problems, then what? Yeah. So that I want people to have better conversations around restructuring than you know, having this simplistic understanding of how political power works, where all you need to do is move a few pieces across the chessboard and, you know, uh, it's a checkmate. No, that's not how politics works anywhere, certainly not in Nigeria. Extending that a bit, one of the reasons why restructuring is quite heavy on the menu of political discussion these days is the insecurity issue. Kidnappings, killings, the farmer herders clash, and all that. So let's disentangle some of the issues a bit. Boko Haram largely started as an internal dispute, but now it has morphed into a transnational problem, you know, given the problems yeah. in the Sahel and the now heavy presence and creeping influence of the Islamic states in some parts of Nigeria, the Northeast and the Northwest. There is the issue that is already brewing in the Southeast, basically surrounding IPOP and the whole unknown government situation. There is the now almost regular skirmishes between farmers and herders in the Southwest of Nigeria. And I know you and I talk about this. When people talk about insecurity, there really isn't anything that is new. I mean, kidnappings have always been happening in Nigeria. Armed robbery has always been a thing. I just feel the Nigerian state has never felt safe. So what we are seeing at the moment, which seems to be on a larger scale, is it still an extension of state failure or we are really witnessing something new? that probably genuinely threatens the stability of the country, whatever we may define that to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a mixture of both. You know, I do think that these are contemporary manifestations of long existing problems, but I also do think that in their current iteration, they can and do threaten the, I guess, territorial stability of Nigeria. You know, when you look at the fact that Nigeria, for one thing, is more poorer to pay than it was 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, uh, if you want to come a little further closer in time. You also have a larger population, right? Depending on what or whom you believe, Nigeria is anywhere between 160 million and 210 million, right? But let's earn the more conservative side. Let's say it's 160 million. That's still a lot of people, right? When yeah. you look at the number of policemen and how the number of policemen per square mile, or yeah, I forget the, I can't think of the description right now, but the number of policemen per territory is one of the lowest on the continent, not even just in the region or anything, on the continent. It's one of the poorly policed parts of the world, right? And you have all of these political, institutional, and conceptual problems with law enforcement in Nigeria. You have the fact that because of decades of um, you know, corruption and underfunding, poor recruitment, and being superseded by the Nigerian army, the police is not in any way capable of responding to internal threats to Nigeria. Then you have, of course, the fact that the army has assumed so much of what is basic law enforcement responsibility in Nigeria 
taken away from the army's actual capabilities, impacting the territorial integrity of Nigeria, right? So all of these events have had a knock-on effect on the entire security infrastructure of Nigeria, whether it's law enforcement, whether it's intelligence, whether it's the military, whether it's civil defense, whether it's immigration, you know, all of these entities are fundamentally in a poor shape and are poorly disposed to protect Nigeria's territorial integrity and to ensure the collective security of Nigerian lives and property. So when you look at the combination of all those factors and the fact that Nigeria is surrounded by equally fragile, if not more fragile states, terribly porous borders, you get the sense that there is something new this time. You know, when you look at all of those dimensions and, of course, environmental factors and, you know, things like that. And a poorly performing economy, one of the worst performing on the continent, again, you know, there is so much that's new, but there's a lot that's old. So I think the answer can be both, that these problems are not new in any way. And, you know, there have been large-scale threats to Nigeria across the board, right? But when you look at the combination of everything I just discussed and the fact that these large upswells and uprisings are happening simultaneously, you know, you look at the Southwest, you have problems with cultism and kidnapping. And of course, now you've got this issue with Sunday, Boho, and, you know, all of those um, the multidimensionally related issues. In the Southeast, you have these attacks on state installations and you know, long existing feelings of disaffection, which of course manifests itself in violence. In the South South, you have long existing problems of cultism and um, uh, militancy, kidnappings. Uh, in the North Central, you have the farmers' herders crisis. In the Northwest, you have banditry, cattle rustling, and many more um, issues of security. Then you have in the Northeast, of course, Boko Haram and other threats, because Boko Haram sometimes downplays the multidimensional nature of security where multiple drivers of conflict and violence are happening concurrently. So you look across the board in Nigeria, and I've said many times that this is, to my mind, easily the most unstable Nigeria has been in two decades. And I think when you look at the statistics that get put out about um, the numbers of people who get kidnapped, numbers of people who get killed by herdsmen or you know, militants or kidnappers or the police or you know, law enforcement, when you just look at the sheer number of deaths, killings in Nigeria, there is zero question in my mind that something is different about this. Yeah. I'm a big fan of comparative politics, even though maybe someone like you might uh, criticize that as a bit too impersonal. So if we look at, say, maybe some of the historical reasons why a lot of these fissures are happening in Nigeria and even the phenomenon of state failure itself, I mean, just to detour also a bit, there was these two pair of essays in foreign, oh, foreign dear. policy. Yeah, I knew you were good to break that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> foreign affairs. We, well, actually, both. Yeah. You know, there was, uh, John Campbell wrote one piece in foreign policy, and there were these two pieces in foreign affairs. So, yeah, both. Yeah. So, I don't know if you read both. Anyway, so I did. I did. Uh, I did. I regretted doing so, but I mean, here we are. So, we're making two counterclaims using the same country. Basically, mm-hmm. and my thoughts were there has to be a more systematic way of thinking about this where everything just doesn't devolve into, oh, yeah, I have an opinion and I can form mm-hmm. them using very much the same data points. Right? Exactly. So, what is the most systematic way of looking at the phenomenon of state failure or, or a failed state or a state that simply has the inability to project power to its territories, you know, where the seat of power might be in Maiduguri, but you have active insurgency 120 kilometers away from the capital in the same states. You know, mm-hmm. so what is the most systematic way of thinking about this is Jeffrey Herbs, for example, writes to talk about costs, boundaries, and the international systems of this. Is it colonialism with some of the artificial boundaries that came to be from this trouble for Africa? What exactly is the way to think clearly 
and have clear ideas so that we can then have productive debate about this. Yeah, so my, um, you know, I'm personally not a fan of the failed state thesis, as again, I often talk about you know, on Twitter and elsewhere. I shared a, a, I guess, critique of those two articles, but specifically the one in um, Foreign Affairs, talking about Nigeria using the failed state thesis, because my view always is that governments fail people and not the other way around. People don't fail their government. So when a state is failing, uh, it puts the burden on the people who largely are victims of that failure, as it were. And it does so ignoring circumstances of state creation, which, of course, when you ask yourself those kinds of questions, then you come to arrive at the fact that a political entity like Nigeria was artificially designed more than a century ago by colonial imperial powers who wanted to extract from it. And they handed over what was, in effect, a colonial state. You know, you can talk about, you know, independence all you want to, but nothing about the Nigerian state is different today from what it was in 1960, frankly speaking, because the relationship between state and citizen was one of, you know, conquistador, as they would say in Spanish. And the Nigerian state extracts and kills like no other. That's all the Nigerian state does. You know, so if you understand that to be the relationship under which Nigerian statehood was birthed, so when you ask existential questions about how the Nigerian state or any other creations of imperial colonial rule, when you ask those kinds of questions, then you will be able to say, okay, we don't want this and we would rather design something this way. But when you leave it as, oh, you know, a failed state, then that's when you get the kind of surface analysis of, oh, you know, patrimonialism or corruption or all of this. It's not that these things don't exist, but you have to ask deeper questions about why they exist. What is the genesis of that kind of behavior? How did it manifest itself within the polity in those countries? And, you know, how do you stem that kind of behavior without going on this wild goose chase about trying to... um keep water out of a basket. And I think that's what those uh, two theses fail to do. You know, both the one saying Nigeria wasn't a failed state and the one saying Nigeria was a failed state. They were fundamentally starting from a flawed premise. There's entire literature critiquing the failed state thesis. I can't, you know, begin to run through all of it right now, but fundamentally that's what the, those critiques say. That and so many other things, of course. You know, when you say that a state is failed, you ignore the fact that perhaps the people who are governed that the state never even chose those things. And by and large, it was imposed upon them. And the elites who gained power in quote unquote independence it was in their interest to retain that system of government, right? Because that is where they derived a form of political legitimacy. So when you understand all of these dimensions, then you can see, you know, the impact of the colonial legacy in Africa, certainly in Nigeria. When you do a little bit of political history and find the levels of disagreement among the early independents and campaigners about what the Nigerian state should look like and how Britain thwarted many of those people who wanted a much less prominent relic of British colonial rule in Nigeria and how Britain thwarted them, then you understand why the failed state thesis misses the mark. Yeah. Let's talk about some of your own, I would say, frontier ideas, so to speak. Yes. You want the nation state abolished. I find that weird. Yes. Why? Okay. Um, so, firstly, the nation state is not that new to start with. You know, the nation state in real terms, has only existed for probably no more than 200 years, right? You know, everyone thinks that, well, by everyone, I mean like conventional imagination, thinks it started with the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia, but actually it didn't. The Treaty of Westphalia addressed other things, but the historiography of that treaty captured state creation as what that treaty was all about. But in any case, State creation started in the imperial era, really, in the 19th century, when the European powers were competing for territory across the world. 
So it's a very new system of governance. It's a very new political order. We have lived for centuries, really, in other forms of political order, such as um, city-states, confederations, other federative structures around the world. There have been other geopolitical orders that were much less violent. They offered much better alternatives to universal rights and principles than the nation states, at least in certain parts of the world. So there are alternatives. And what I find to be troubling about the nation states is that it's fundamentally backward looking in that, for one thing, the only logic of the existing nation states, in my view, is the nationalist ideology itself, you know, where a state is formed by ethno national groups calling themselves nations or people and the national territory is defined as their homeland, you know, there's no justification other than just the mere existence of that territory. So it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, it becomes very circular in its reasoning where biological descent from the past inhabitants of that territory is the fundamental basis of the nation states. Whereas there are other ways of thinking about rights and citizenship. Rather than this hierarchically structured order of territoriality and centralized Westphalian state systems, you know, there have been federative structures that even existed way before they did in Europe. Latin America is a classic example. You know, Haiti quite literally emerged from that tradition, right? After defeating France. Whether Brazil, um, Bolivia, and other parts of Central and South America, there were federative structures that emerged out of overthrowing Spanish and Portuguese imperial rule. So I feel very weird about the fact that people deliberately want to limit their imagination to a geopolitical order that only existed for, historically speaking, a very short period of time and has proven to be very violent. You know, when you look in terms of recorded violence, some of the worst episodes of organized violence in history. They have happened under the nation state. Of course, this by no means downplays the significance of prior episodes of violence before the nation state emerged, right? But when you look at the promise of what the nation state is supposed to be and its actual outputs, whether it's global capitalism, whether it's um, imperial rule, whether it's colonialism, you know, whether it's support for authoritarianism around the world, fascism, some of the worst instincts of the human existence have happened under the nation state. And it's quite deliberately so, because when you put a geopolitical order of ethno-nationalism and centralized, hierarchically ordered systems of government, where powerful elites get to dictate and get to make the people submit to their order rather than the other way around, then, my goodness, that's what you're going to get. So I look around the world, but most especially on the continent of Africa, I look at all of these artificial creations of the 19th century and look at how they're performing in terms of their fundamental purpose of providing security, prosperity, and the freedom to be free from violence to their people. They're not performing very well. And you look at other political orders, like Somaliland, which, imperfect as it is, when you look at the geopolitical order they have in Somaliland, and you look at indigenous communities across the world, and look at, you know, previously acephalous communities in Africa and elsewhere, and look at the way government and governance was able to be dispersed in a socially democratic way, and you look at the nation states, which empowers tyrants, dictators, large corporations that abuse the planet and destroy it and are frankly making it more inhabitable by the day. What's so good about any of this that anyone wants to retain? So that's where I come from. I don't think I'll ever say this in a million years, but the people that I've heard express similar sentiments to the one you just did, or arguments, I don't want to say sentiments, are libertarian historians. It's interesting because you're a socialist. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> yes, absolutely. In fact, I, I remember, I think the last Twitter discussion we had about this, I said that, you know, I'm an anti-state socialist, and there's a very strong tradition of that in socialism, you know. Um, they are anti-state socialists, they are libertarian socialists, and this is where very often, and you've seen me talk about this on Twitter, point out to people that statism and socialism are not the same thing, you know. They are 
state socialists, of course, and by virtue of the fact that the nation state is the most dominant political order in the world, but there are socialists who reject that order. So my anti-state socialist views are very much part of a long tradition in political thought, certainly to socialism. So on that one issue, I guess there is some commonality. Where I think the difference is that in this alternative um, political order, to whom does authority lie with? And with many libertarians, they inevitably settle on corporations. Of course, as a socialist, I don't settle on that. I believe in a much more socially democratic dispersion of power and authority. But yeah, there is a very large bridge intersecting especially right libertarianism and left anti-state socialism. Yeah. I think my favorite moniker will still be the former Greek finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis, who calls himself a libertarian Marxist. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, no, absolutely. So you're also a critic of the so-called Libra International Order. What yes. is wrong with it? Because usually the way I look at this is that in the world today, I don't think there's any state, if we are being realistic, that can escape either being a beneficiary or a victim of great power competitions. So whether yeah. it is between the US and the Soviet Union or the US and China and whatever arrangements great international powers have going on. And I kind of see the Libra international order, so to speak, as the, I don't know, maybe the best of all evils, should I say? Mm-hmm. So what is your criticism of the Libra International Order? What is wrong with it? My main criticism of the Libra International Order is that it's not all that liberal and it's not all that international. It's not all that liberal in the sense that its stated aims and aspirations very much differ to the actual outputs and outcomes of this order. Whether it's, as I stated earlier, the support for neoliberalism, which has uprooted and destroyed you know, living conditions around the world, driven socioeconomic inequality around the world, polluting the environment, whether it's supporting dictators under the guise of anti-communism, whether it's supporting coups in um, states where, quote-unquote, communist leaders exist, you know, in pursuing this domino theory that, oh, if there's one communist state here, then there'll be in others around them. Whether it's forcing weaker states into lopsided um, geopolitical and economic agreements against their will that they obviously cannot benefit from, whether it's bilateral agreements or multilateral agreements, you know, you look at the so-called uh, multilateral trading system, the WTO, for example, which basically have been crippled essentially because of the United States government, both the previous administration and this one, because this one has yet to do anything about those long-running issues with the appellate court or whatever. You know, you look at the international system around us, whether you want to start with NATO, the United Nations, the WTO, as I mentioned, the IMF, the World Bank, and what you have is the United States and its Western allies essentially determining the terms and conditions under which the rest of the world should exist or not. And the question to ask is that, If the U.S. and its allies continue to push this mantra of liberalism and it's not playing out the way that they promised it should or it would, then what is wrong with thinking of some alternative solution? And what is wrong with other members outside this so-called liberal international order? Because my main beef about it, as I've stated, is the fact that it's exclusionary, right? It's a small club, really, of the United States, its Western allies, and a handful of, I guess, non-NATO allies, you know, countries like Israel, you know, South Korea, who are not, quote, Western in the sense of not being in the Western Hemisphere, but they are geopolitically aligned with the West, especially the Anglophone West. So they get to be beneficiaries of the nodes of global governance that the U.S. and its Western allies oversee. So outside that club, who else gets to benefit from that? And the defenders of this order will say the things, you know, you started off with, yeah, you know, it's led to prosperity around the world. You know, capitalism has led to a reduction of poverty and industrialization, this, that, and the other thing. And my immediate retort would be, yes, but at what cost? And it's led to all of those developments for whom, you know, it's led to all of those developments for a small class of people who were 
predisposed to take advantage of those developments and everybody else gets shafted. I don't need to run through all of the large-scale studies of wealth and income inequality across the Western Hemisphere and beyond. I don't need to talk about the degradation of the environment around the world, pollution. I don't need to talk about the years of sustained support for authoritarian regimes in Central and South America, in Africa, and turning all these places to Cold War playgrounds. So when you look at the trajectory of this liberal international order, it's not all that liberal, and it's not all that international, and it's not even all that orderly either, because this so-called order has led to millions, quite literally tens, if not hundreds, of deaths of wars of so-called cold conflicts, you know, hot wars, destroyed economies. There is so much that has gone wrong under the stewardship of the U.S. in this quote-unquote liberal international order. So where is the liberalism? Now, of course, I would say that the liberalism as it's referred to is contextual. You know, liberalism isn't static, and I don't want to go too much into a riff on this, but liberalism, you know, is adaptative, right, you know, in the 19th century, liberalism meant one thing. In the 18th century, it meant one, one thing. In the 20th, it meant one thing. In the 21st century, it meant something else. So I get that. But the liberalism, as it referred to back then, was largely economic, right? You know, free markets, free trade, reduction of tariffs and non-tariff uh, barriers to trade, open markets, reduced capital controls, all of these things. U.S. and its Western allies supported all of those things because, well, they were seeking new markets, right? Now, at this point in history, where China has risen to become a peer country and uh, a rival, a geopolitical rival, mercantilism is back all of a sudden. See how that works, right? You know, the EU is pushing national champions. Now, the EU as an entity, I think people, and just for the purpose of disclosure, I'm a scholar of the EU. The EU is actually one of my scholastic bread and butters. You know, I studied for a year in um, Strasbourg and I did an externship at the European Commission. Uh, so I'm a Europeanist. So I guess I can have an appreciation for the European Union's history and political trajectory in ways that might not be so obvious to the lay person. But the EU has always been a mercantilist body, if you understand it, its origins and its present construction, right? The U.S. has always given the facade of being supportive of these descriptions of what liberalism is, as long as it favored it. Now, when you have rising powers like a China, like an India, like a Turkey, I guess, if you want to include them, all of a sudden, everyone is now. But Nixon famously said, we are all uh, Keynesians now. I guess we are all mercantilists now, right? Because every single country across the globe, every major power is pursuing mercantilism unabashedly, right? So I think all of these developments are a reflection of the fact that the rest of the world, which always knew, let me be clear, that the liberal international order, quote unquote, had all these internal contradictions. They recognized that they weren't going to sit by and just whine about it and do nothing. They were simply going to try to best the West at their own game. And that's quite literally what China did, you know. All the celebrations of the virtues of unfettered capitalism in terms of industrialization and poverty reduction and this and that, I never hear those champions of all of that refer to China, which actually has a much better record on any of those things than the West. You know, is it poverty reduction? You know, then some studies put the number of people brought out of poverty in China since it's quote unquote opened up at 800 million. 800 million. That's an unheard of, that is an unmatched record of poverty reduction. But I never hear the high priests and priestesses of unfettered neoliberalism and capitalism talk about this. I never hear about the industrialization of, of China, where at this point it's reached pay status in so many areas of research and development, in technology, in innovation, you know, in infrastructure, you know, I, I would I say best, most of the West on that front, on transportation. So I think all of these developments reflect the fact that the rest of the world realizes that the liberal international order is not all that liberal, it's not all that international, and it's certainly not all that orderly. 
So an alternative to the liberal international order for many, well, most, in my view, of the members outside that club simply felt an alternative needed to be pursued by someone else. And that someone else happens to be China. And they simply will go along with China. Now, my view is a little different in this, in that I don't think China, despite what people think, wants to upturn the liberal international order. It simply wants to play around it. China wants to have its cake and eat it, basically speaking. It realizes that it doesn't have the structural advantages that the U.S. has. You know, it doesn't have nearly the alliances that the U.S. has. You know, the U.S. dollar remains the global currency of reserve. All of the key international institutions, all of the seats of global governance, whether it's finance, you know, um, Washington, D.C., for the European Central Bank, are largely in Western capitals, right? Modes of international finance, commerce, trade, culture are largely dominated by the U.S. and its Western allies. China recognizes all of this, but it also knows that the countries China wants to build relations and possibly partnerships with are also part of this international system. So rather than try to build something from scratch, simply use it as a channel to reach those people, and that's what China has done. To me, the most vivid example is the two development banks that China created, whether it's the Asian Infrastructure Bank or the, I forget the name of the other one. China is simply following the Bretton Woods model in that regard. Um, Belt and Road, to me, is not that distinct to any other, you know, a lot of people like to draw the comparisons to, um, what's it, the Marshall Plan. You know, I generally don't like Marshall Plan comparisons because I think there are some very contextual issues involved there that aren't easily replicable. But I see where that comes from. And China is sort of looking at Africa in similar ways, right? That let's build up, let's connect, let's um, link up this continent in ways that Chinese goods and services, Chinese influence, political influence, economic influence, cultural influence, social influence can bookend our rising power status. So all of these developments, I think, reflect on the fact that the liberal international order has failed to deliver for people outside of that small club. Yeah. I hear you, Chris, but before I proceed to my final question for you, on the economics, hasn't socialism failed? Or are you also, as a socialist, prone to this bias, quote and unquote, of if it failed, it's not socialism? Because when you look at Soviet Union, Stalin, Mao, I can go on and on, those were regimes that were professedly socialist and failed to deliver prosperity to their people. Instead, they delivered massive hunger death, Mm. starvation, and uh, a lot of brutality. So Mm. wouldn't you say that socialism also has a poor record, especially on the economics? Well, I guess my response, uh, you know, that's that's like a classic uh, critique of socialism. My response is that socialism has historically varied, you know, in different parts of the world, right? You know, socialism, Mm. again, is contextual to where it's been. There's uh, the socialism of the European social democracy tradition, right? There is the Fabian um, element that's uh, from um, Great Britain. Um, There is Bolivarian socialism. You know, there's African socialism. So um, socialism has varied. And then people always refer to the Soviet Union. In real terms, the Soviet Union was more of a state capitalist entity. You know, the means uh, and modes of production were largely controlled by the state apparatus, the political right, who by and large empowered cronies inside and outside the party, giving them unfettered access to the means and modes of production, while, of course, the state was directing where their capital and their input should go to. So in many instances, the examples that people often refer to as the uh, illustrations of failed socialism, were never quite that, you know. And you will hear this a lot from socialists from many of these places, 
who will tell you that, especially for those who consider them, themselves uh, Leninists or, you know, Trotskyites or any of these variations that emerged from the Russian Revolution or even um, Maoist, because, you know, at some point there was the Sino-Soviet split, you know, you will have dissidents in China or from China who will tell you that at various points, Mao diverged from the um, type of socialism he should have pursued. But in any case, I'm not here to be a defender of any excesses of socialism. I'm not an ideologue to that extent, you know, and I always criticize capitalism's knee-jerk fans and defenders for their blinkered view of what societies look like and how, for them, the end justifies the means. I'm not going to repeat that kind of behavior that I condemn. So I make very clear that there have been socialist or social democratic, whatever the terminology you want to use, there have been leaders and governments across the globe who have erred in starving people, in detaining dissidents, and killing people, pursuing civil wars and assassinations and any of that kind of behavior. And none of that is defensible for the pursuit of some socialist utopia. None of that. If I can condemn that from the other side, I see no difficulty in condemning that when you know fellow travelers do that. So I will never sit here and say that the pursuit of a socialist utopia justified any kind of mass starvation. And I will never say that every single socialist leader that I approve of got it 100% correct, whether it's on economics or whether it's on democratization or anything in between. I will never defend the excesses of any socialist leader ever. So to that point, I'm sure that there have been areas socialist leaders have failed. No question about that. And for me, the aim, especially as someone whose work engages with, you know, developing countries where you need to, first of all, get to a place of industrialization and poverty reduction before you then start to engage in some of these esoteric debates about capitalism versus communism versus socialism and all of these things. I always like to point out that in the real world of socioeconomic development, it's not so binary. You know, um, states who are pursuing industrialization and economic development and social development don't look at it in that way. You will find professed socialist governments using the market as a tool, as a means of exchange, for example, right? You will find socialist leaders who have no problems creating state-owned entities, right? You will have no problems with Marxist or even socialist leaders who pursue small L liberalism if the times call for it, if the times fit, if that is the political consensus that could be arrived at. Conversely, you will find ardent free marketeers who might pursue wage control, right? Who might have tariffs. The U.S. government has, from the beginning of time, used tariffs as a tool of its foreign economic policy forever. You know, everyone thinks the Trump administration overdid it with tariffs. But then I like to remind people that, well, the Obama administration used tariffs. The Obama administration uses um, CFIUS, you know, the committee that reviews foreign investment, where it can instruct U.S. companies to divest from its foreign ownership in firms or block them from taking over U.S. companies. Right. I know those are not, I'm not saying those are tariffs, but the point I'm making is that here is the professed arbiter of free market capitalism, where its government uses the power of the state to protect domestic interests. So in the real world of economic policy making, it's not so binary. And I referred to this just yesterday that I would like for these political economy discussions on Twitter and elsewhere to be a little more, a little more cognizant of these nuances. You know, very often people launch into bumper sticker debates that they heard on CNN or the US politics blogs that they read or their favorite commentators on Twitter. In the real world of policy, it's not that simple. It's never been that simple, and it will never be that simple. You have to be iterative in terms of what you understand to be the right solutions for the time. My biases remain towards socialism, for sure. But, as I said, I recognize the use of social markets, right? 
as a means of exchange in an economy. You know, very literally, the German model of economic production is the social market economy, right? That's what the Adenauer and subsequent German chancellors are built up in Germany's social democracy. The um, Nordics have their Nordic model, which is this mixture of um, social liberalism with a little bit of Nordic socialism, right? And then you have in East Asia, where in a country like Hong Kong, the majority of land is owned by the states, but you know it can be sold at least to private entities, right? Same thing in Singapore, same thing in South Korea, or even in Japan, where MITI led the push for the post-war industrialization and economic growth that put Japan as the leader of the flying geese, as it were. So when you think very deeply about economic development, social development, these don't lend themselves to esoteric debates that fizzled out at the end of the 20th century. That's very illuminating. Finally, you are also a critic of so-called African experts who Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. analyze the continent, some foreign, some local. Mm -hmm. What are the common mistakes you see with these approaches and how can they be better? Mm. The number one for me is that they by and large engage with a very narrow subset of people. Mostly elites in capitals and large cities, financial elites, especially political elites, highly visible groups like um, white collar professionals, creatives, people in the tech space. Poets, I guess that's on their creatives. Um, you know, people who as visible and brilliant in their spheres as they are do not represent the length and breadth of those of respective African societies and don't necessarily have all the answers. That you are brilliant in one sphere doesn't necessarily make you brilliant in other spheres. But because these people have the visibility, they get to interact with these so-called Africa experts, right? Who then take, first of all, their own biases? Because I think this is the most important point to sort of flag here. And I'm sure you follow um, Onyekuzi on Twitter. And one Mm -hmm. point he makes very often, which I 1000% agree with, that these people often pose as neutral observers, right? You know, that we are disinterested parties. That's completely untrue. They are not. There is no such thing as a neutral observer. Everybody has a bias. Everybody has a position. Everybody has a preference. Everybody has ideas. But, you know, these people take their own disinterested observer status, mix it up with this very blinkered interaction with a small subset of elites and the middle class and present unrepresentative ideas about, quote, Africa to a world that knows nothing about what's happening on the continent. And then, you know, this affects policy. I won't name any names here, but many of them follow me and they often don't like the things I have to say because, you know, I guess they feel put on the spot. But my response to them is that, look, in your capacity, you have a reach that I never will. Policymakers in your country, whether it's the US, the UK, France, Germany, name it, you have an audience that I can never reach by virtue of who I am. People of consequence listen to you both in your country and even here. That's the thing. That, that's the crucial point, that these people have a lot of suasion here on the continent, here in Nigeria. I've said many times that a division head at an international investment bank in London or, well, London especially, or London and New York, probably has more access to your finance minister as an African than you do. And I don't think I'm exaggerating, because first of all, these are the people I work with. Right. And these are the people I've interacted with the majority of my career. And these are things that can be observed. It is not uncommon, for example, for these international bankers that I referred to, to jump on a flight, for example, in order to try to catch a finance minister going to London or to Dubai. People do this all the time. How many Africans can afford to do that? Or it is not uncommon for, quote unquote, foreign correspondents to just zoom off into a ministry, for example, or even a presidential or prime ministerial residence and try to get an appointment with a foreign leader. These things happen all the time. I've seen them happen in several capital cities across the continent, not just in Nigeria. 
How many Africans can afford to do that? So the point I'm getting at, without going off too much on a tangent, is that these people have consequential influence. You know, Onion Kuzi always talks about, you know, think tankers, right? Absolutely. They have an immense level of influence, especially, you know, within democratic administrations, which tend to be much more receptive towards the institutionalized knowledge in that sense. You know, a ton of think tankers are in the current Biden administration, a ton of them whether it's from Center for American Progress, Brookings, Wilson Center, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the list goes on. You know, think tankers have an immense amount of influence at the highest level of government across the Western Hemisphere. So the things they say, the things they do, the things they write have incredible consequence for us here. So the fact that they have such narrow, uninformed, or misinformed perspectives about life on the continent, a continent they don't live in. Most of them don't speak the language. Most of them only visit sparingly. They do not, these societies, they write about, they speak about, they publish books about, you know, they get research grants about, they do not understand these societies. You can hear the critiques, you can see the critiques that they are often not very good. Like people don't have good things to say about them. And you cannot get away from the colonial nature of that relationship. How many Africans can go on to become U.S. experts, Germany experts, France experts, Swiss experts, Canadian experts? How many? And this is something I often point out to these people when they get peeved at my critique, that even citizens of these countries, including folks like me who have dual nationalities, we get told go back to Africa as an insult for daring to make a single critique of government or politics in these societies. Even in a place like the U.S., even black Americans get told to go back to Africa. So because one thing you often hear from these people is, oh, are you saying white people can't write about Africa? Are you saying white people can't do good work about Africa? Are you saying that only Africans can comment or make critiques of African politics, that anyone can make critiques of Africa in much the same way Africans can critique, you know, U.S. politics? And then that's my response. Well, how many of them do you know? Tell me. I'm all ears. I'm dying to hear them. You know, and the reason why it's a terrible analogy is the fact of the colonial nature of the relationship, right? All of the top think tanks, where are they? They are between London, Washington, and Paris. Okay, some Berlin here, this and that, but the most prominent think tanks are basically between London and Washington. So institutionalized knowledge is not just geographically in the global north. It's intellectually and conceptually domiciled in the global north. And there isn't an equivalent here in Africa. There aren't European centers for this, that, and the third in, you know, Johannesburg, in Abidjan, in Konakri, in Accra, in Abuja. There aren't. It's not that type of relationship. So that narrowness of the way they see Africa is so consequential. And the fundamental mistake that I critique all the time. Another one I would say is um, this sort of technological determinism, you know, this solutionist view that, oh, technology will fix this, that, and the third, you know. I like to criticize this uh, leapfrogging idea that, oh, you know, a drone sending um, drips and medication and can leapfrog the fact that there are terrible roads, that roads are unpaved and insecure and poorly linked to uh, urban and suburban areas. Or the fact that tablets can make up for the fact that schools are overcrowded and the curriculum is outdated or they are not all that safe in these days where, you know, hundreds of kids get kidnapped. E-voting will reduce um, electoral fraud. And, and now that in itself, is I don't think it's so problematic. I sort of sympathize with it. But there is this desire to ignore the broader context in which these developments happen, such as the social legitimacy of the processes involving, or like technological innovation is not an end in and itself. It's a means to an end. You know, what is technology supposed to do for you? And how much can it do? Is it the best solution? Is that where you should put all your financial and non-financial resources? You know, as I always say, you need to ask much better questions. You know, technology can only help you to get to where you yourself have the means of getting to. Technology will not make up for the fact that Nigeria has terrible roads and is poorly connected. You know, how much money can you spend on technology? It's incredibly expensive, right? You know, so 
that sort of solutionism, and you see this in the tech world, where all the tech bros and sissies view themselves as these whiz kids who have all the answers and solutions <laughs> to all of Nigeria's problems. And, you know, these African experts propagate a lot of that. Uh, there's only so much that tech can solve in a society where technology is not even easily deployable. That's the point. You have to look at the problem in its conception and where technology can come in. Technology is not the beginning nor the end of that problem. So that's another mistake I see from the Africa expert crowd. Another one is the fact that they ignore, for example, how remittances, for example, stripped out foreign aid. You know, the last, I don't think I've seen the most recent numbers for remittances into Nigeria for 2020. Um, so this information is not the most up-to-date I have, especially, you know, in light of COVID. But in 2019, it was reported at $25 billion. Yeah. I very rarely hear these conversations happen about what remittances, what impact they have on Nigeria's macroeconomy and microeconomy. By the way, I have my critiques of remittances as a means of um, economic activity. You know, it's too short-term, it's uh, distortionary and all of this stuff. But I want to see more engagement of that rather than this benevolent idea that aid from our countries is necessarily what African countries and Nigeria need to accelerate improvements in areas X, Y, Z. I think there is a fundamental overstatement of the impact of aid among these groups of people. And it's bound to happen because, one, they have their biases, right? They are from those countries and they see themselves as benevolent actors in Africa. And they mostly speak to Western audiences and political elites in this part of the world who, by and large, need that aid because they can provide so many of those services themselves. So there is this epistemic closure that they are prone to where African agency is um, on the court and their own benevolence is played up a little more than it ought to be. So I think in terms of epistemic creation, these are the most fundamental problems that I see because everything else gets into the details and flows from these three elements. You know, the fact that they have a narrow view of African societies, the fact that they lean too much towards technology, and the fact that they discount African agency. Nearly everything else that you may discuss as a behavioral or ideological flaw stems from these conceptual issues. It's been wonderful to have you. And I mean, you've also given me so much to chew on. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Toby, for inviting me back. If you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to the show on any of your favorite podcast vendors. That may be Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or any of the rest. Don't forget to rate us on your platform. It helps others find the show. Or you can just listen or download on our website, www.ideasuntrapped.com. Mm-hmm.